So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to very briefly um, just touch on the exercise I did last week and then cover GPUs today. The first lecture will be talking about the motivation and the architecture of GPUs. And then uh, the second lecture, after at a, about half three, will be um, talking about the programming model, how you actually program GPUs. But in terms of um, last week, um, I put, there weren't that many exercises, but I did put a solution up. It'll be worth spending a few seconds discussing it. Um, if I, can. I put up a scaling plot of the... Um, the parallel traffic model, and if I can maybe zoom in a bit, that was um, a sample sample scaling curve from the traffic model. And what I've done is to illustrate Amdahl's law, I've run on a large number of cores. Now, actually, I've, I've done it in multiples of nodes here, one, two, three, four, five, up to eight nodes, where eight nodes is 24 cores. The reason that I'm not showing the performance scaling within a node, that's from 1 to 24 cores, is that it, it's largely dominated by memory bandwidth issues. So you get poor scaling um, on high numbers of cores on a shared memory node because very quickly all your processes are, are, are saturating the memory bandwidth. So we, we're thinking of uh, the node as sort of being our, our minimal con computational unit. So. At very small uh, sizes, the, 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 the uh, performance actually drops as you increase the number of nodes because the overheads of message passing, uh, this is the message, are actually um, overwhelming the, the benefit of making the computation uh, more, more um, uh, faster. But for moderate sizes, here I have maybe, um, I've got the numbers here, about a million cells, then you start to get what you would recognize as sort of Amdahl's law. So if you look at the highest one, that's about four million cells. And you see the performance starts to increase relatively linearly, but then tails off. So this is what you would expect from Amp. So what you'd expect from Gustafsson's law is this, that the, the bigger the problem is, the better it, it, it runs on large numbers of cores. And that's the, the fact that these curves go up the way illustrates Gustafsson's law. The fact that this curve tails off and isn't linear illustrates Amdahl's law, uh, that the overheads of message passing uh, start to become more um, more prevalent as you go to larger numbers of cores. And, and for the traffic model, that's quite easy to understand because on a, for a given process in the traffic model, it has to compute on the local uh, road and it has to exchange messages to its right neighbor and its left neighbor. So the communication cost is constant, independent of the road size. And so as the road gets smaller, this is strong scaling, a fixed road size with increasing numbers of cores. As the road gets smaller on each core, on each process, the amount of work goes down, but the communication overhead stays largely constant. So it starts to relatively dominate. If you go to very large sizes here, 10 million, you see something weird. And people get very excited about this. They say, oh... I've got super linear scaling. I, I doubled my number of cores from, from 24 to 48, and the program went more than twice as fast. Isn't that amazing? Well, actually, this is where scalability plots um, are, can be deceptive, because what's really actually happening here is it's going slow on one, on one node. So it's actually going relatively slow. The reason is you've got a very, very big road here, and uh, these are relatively small amounts of data. This is a 1D problem. So even a, you know, a million cells is only a megabyte of data, eight, you know, eight megabytes of data or something like that. And so this data typically fits in the cache. So almost all the, I, all, almost all the memory traffic is going into and out of cache, which is fast. However, if you make the road big enough, at some point, it stops fitting in cache and it goes, it goes slow. However, as you increase the number of cores, the problem size on each process, on each core, gets smaller, and at some point it fits into cache. And you get so what you often see is a, a, a performance curve which goes along, then takes a huge hike, and then goes along here. You see these, these 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 spikes in performance, and that is just because the more processes you use, typically the, with strong scaling, the smaller the local problem size is, and at some point it starts to fit into cache, and you get a benefit of. of uh, of, um, of reading and writing to cache memory, not, not to main memory. But there's, so there's quite a lot, even in very, very simple models, 
this 1D traffic model, cellular automata is about the simplest thing you can imagine. The parallelization is about the simplest thing you could imagine. You have to send one cell to the right and one cell to the left and receive one from the right and one from the left. But when you start to do actual practical performance measurements, although the models like Gustafsson's law and Amdahl's law give you a framework to discuss them in the detail, they're always much more complicated. So having done that, I just wanted to go on to... Uh, I'm going to give two lectures. First, a very brief introduction to GPUs, and then I'll go into some into more depth uh, about how they work. So these lectures were actually developed by a colleague of mine, Alan Gray, who worked at EPCC for many years. He left EPCC a couple of months ago. He actually still has an office in EPCC, and he actually works for NVIDIA, who are one of the major GPU manufacturers. So, so um, Alan's expertise in GPUs hasn't been lost to the community, which is nice. So um, first of all, just to, this is kind of recapping what we did, but it was three weeks ago. Um, if you have a standard CPU, it has to do a lot of things. I mean, your, your, your laptop, your mobile phone, your, your, your departmental server have a huge number of tasks to do. And so um, most CPUs, I said maybe until a decade ago, had a, a compute core for, for arithmetic, the thing that actually did that addition and subtraction, multiplication and division. But there's a lot of other controllers around the app. There's a lot of stuff around the side and memory caches and things like this. But as the, we saw, the increases in CPU performance were achieved through increases of this single, the cl clock frequency of the single core. And about 10 years ago, um, this stopped, and now we're not getting any faster cores. We're getting more, more cores together. So... So that was how CPUs developed. About 10 years ago, 10 or 12 years ago, this Moore's law stopped translating into increases in clock speed and translated into higher uh, parallelism on a CPU, more cores on a CPU. Now, alongside that, people were wanting to do more and more realistic gaming. So the gaming industry was independently de 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 developing chips for doing graphics processing, GPUs. And G uh, doing graphics is quite a specialized um, task, and so although developing a chip is incredibly expensive, it was worth the while for companies to develop their own GPUs. And so the silicon in these chips was largely devoted to high numbers of simple cores, simple cores devoted to being able to do graphics, and the sophistication that you have in a normal CPU was left to the side. And so um, what happens is that all the general purpose, if you, have a, if you have a games machine, the general purpose computing is typically done by a standard CPU, but you'll have a GPU for doing the graphics. And the nice thing about doing graphics is graphics is really intrinsically parallel, that when you're, you're doing an image, to a large extent, generating the pixels in this part of the image is independent from um, generating the pixels in, in this part of the, of the image. And so you can do a parallelization naively over pixels in the image. And also that number is very high. You have large numbers of pixels. Um, in a modern display, you have millions of pixels. So the architecture of GPUs has really evolved for this purpose of uh, playing games. And if you look now at the way that the, um, that the um, performance has gone up over the years, CPU performance has been going up like this. This is um, floating point operations. But GPU performance has been going up really, really fast. Uh, GPUs didn't used to be very good at double precision because, in, I mean, if you're playing a game, okay, you probably don't need double precision accuracy. If in one frame, one pixel is off by one position, you know, it'll get lost in the noise or in the exhaust fumes from the car or whatever you're rendering. But, but they were able to put double precision in uh, relatively um, recently, and so double precision performance has gone up high. So a modern GPU is, you know, something like an order of magnitude, possibly more floating point performance than a modern CPU. But equally importantly for high performance computing, GPUs have to process a lot of data. Um, and um, the memory bandwidth is important. So the memory bandwidth on the GPU has been going up actually more impressively. So this, is, this illustrates that the major problem for high-performance computing for CPUs is that although the, the, the performance of a CPU has been going up, the performance of the memory, how fast you can read and write data, has been staying, ha far, uh, uh, this is, they're staying flat. This is a bit like saying I've got a really, really fast car, but I'm limited to 70 miles per hour on the motorway. There's not really any point. But can we use GPUs for general purpose computation? Yes, we can. And the terminology is called GPGPUs, general purpose graphics pro processing. And the way it works is the GPU, that they're commonly called accelerators, is that it accelerates the, the system. So there are two issues here. One is that you have a system which is heterogeneous. You have, you have a CPU and a GPU in the same computer. 
But se secondly, they're distinct from each other, and you have to transfer data from the CPU to the GPU. So most lines of code are executed on the CPU, but the key computational kernels are offloaded to the GPU. And this is using a technique called stream computing, which I'll cover later on. And so the aim is to perform, the, the overall it performs better than use of the CPU alone. So the idea is you take a code and you identify the computationally intensive kernels and you offload them to the GPU. Uh, and now um, they're, they're firmly established in HPC. They've become a bit relatively mainstream. And the way it works, and I'll cover this a lot more in detail in the third lecture, just at half past three, is that um, it's something of a reinvention this was a model which was, um, which is actually around maybe 20 years ago in the early days of parallel computing. You can call it data parallelism, but it's now called stream computing. But the, ba the basic point is that um, rather than having a sort of top-down approach, you have a bottom-up approach. So your computation is based on the very smallest element. So what you would do, you, have, you write a computational function, which is a kernel, which operates on a single element. Now, these are called threads. They're, not, they're analogous to, but not the same as the normal thread you get in a, in a, on a Linux laptop or something. But what this is saying is that in the traffic model, what you would do is you would write a function which updates one cell. That's your fundamental unit of computation. Uh, you, update, you write a function that updates one cell, and this becomes one um, GPU thread, and then you you launch vast numbers of threads at once, thousands, millions of threads at once. And the way that the GPU is designed is that it is able to cope with a vastly higher number of, of th threads than physical CPU cores. Somebody asked me after, um, I think it was the first or the second lecture, they thought that I'd made a mistake, and it was a very perceptive question. They said, when I was talking about load balancing, I had a picture of um, the Mona Lisa saying that to load balance that problem, we needed to have more tasks than threads. And they didn't understand. They said, well, if, you want, if your machine has 16 cores, why don't you launch 64 threads? And then the machine can just schedule them itself. Okay? My model was we have 64 tasks, and it's up to the programmer to map them manually to 16 threads, which map onto the 16 cores. The reason why we don't launch large numbers of threads, which you could do, is operating systems aren't particularly good at, at coping with lots of threads. Swapping a thread around, although it's quicker than swapping a process, it's still a relatively heavyweight operation. So if you have a lot of, if you have more threads than physical cores, your operating system could spend all its time swapping them around and no time doing computation. So for standard CPUs, the solution in HPC, which isn't elegant but it's pragmatic, is we typically run the same number of threads as physical cores, and we manually get those threads to do different tasks. GPUs are built specifically to be able to cope with many more threads of execution than physical cores. They can swap them around with very low latency. And that's done um, for two reasons. First of all, it makes load balancing easier. You just throw lots of tasks at the GPU, and it runs them, and, and the load balancing is, is taken care of more efficient, more, more easily, because you simply have a lot of, 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 of threads of execution. But secondly, it allows it to hide latency like memory latency. If one thread is, 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 is requesting data from memory on a CPU, that thread would just block until the, until the data arrives. On a GPU, the GPU rapidly recognizes the thread is blocked on memory access, deschedules it, and brings in another thread to take over. And so that the way that we hide memory latency is, is, is through this technique of, of throwing lots and lots of threads at the hardware, but the hardware is built to support this large oversubscription. It's suitable for data parallel problems. The data parallel problem is, is one where basically you're applying the same operation to a large number of elements. And that's clearly true of the traffic model. You, the, the update rule for a cell was independent, was the same for all million, 10 million cells. And it's actually true of a lot of scientific and technical problems. And so, in fact, um, this, this model maps well onto scientific and technical computing. So um, you, have to, um, you, have to, you, you have to alter your code. You can't run a standard code on a GPU. And you have to decompose the problem. Uh, and we'll talk about how to do that in CUDA. You have to manage the data transfer between the two, the two systems. And C, C++, Fortran aren't enough. And these have been extended. And there's a lot of, a lot of uh, research going into what is the best model for programming these heterogeneous CPU plus GPU systems. But the one which is most commonly used at the moment, at least in high performance computing, is to use CUDA. CUDA is an extension to C, C++, Fortran, and it's actually proprietary. It's NVIDIA's own um, 
uh, programming model. And so that is a downside of it. It's not portable. There are portable versions. OpenCL can be used, but OpenCL, because of its portability, tends to be, out to be a lot more verbose. And so if you're happy to just use NVIDIA GPUs, then CUDA is, is a practical um, solution at the moment. Um, and in fact, because high performance computing is dominated, we'll come back to this by NVIDIA GPUs, that's been the model. Uh, there are other models, uh, but at the moment, um, um, CUDA is probably the one which is, uh, which is dominant. So as an illustration of, of how this is going, if I go back to my web browser, I think I said that uh, in the first lecture that the speed of supercomputers is very much is, is measured by um, the top 500 list, and the most recent top 500 list was just released uh, this week at the International Supercomputing Conference in um, Frankfurt, in Germany. And if we look at the list, we'll see that the two largest systems in the world are still the, the, the Japanese, uh, sorry, the Chinese systems, these um, Sunway and Tianhe too. I think that's Tianhe. I think Tianhe means swallow. I might be wrong. But the next two largest systems in the world are uh, from Cray, and they're heterogeneous CPU GPU systems. So you'll see that this uh, this, this machine and this machine um, are both Cray systems. One in the U.S., one in Switzerland, and they. Um, I'll come back to this. They're remarkably similar to Archer, but. The, the, at a high level, but on a node level, they have GPUs. And so this machine has, um, it's achieved 20, terafl uh, um, 20 uh, petaflops on the Linpack benchmark. So uh, the third and fourth most powerful machines in the world are hybrid CPU GPU systems. So just a bit more um, about architecture. Um, we don't really go a lot, I don't talk a lot about CPU architecture when I'm, well, when we're talking about parallel programming models of shared and distributed memory, I try and keep the, 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 the description relatively conceptual. However, the programming model which has been developed for GPUs using CUDA is really quite, it's not particularly high level, it really is quite tightly tied to the, the current architecture of GPUs. So it's worth going over the architecture of GPUs because then the programming model makes sense. It's not particularly high level. Um, so I'll talk about, I'll, I'll skip over a bit the need for accelerators. We've done that. And then I'll talk about um, how they're put together. So, I mean, it's very useful to recap what the performance limitings are for sort of scientific and technical computing. The amount of data you can process at once, which is parallelism, how fast you can process each element, which is the clock speed, how much data you need to transfer, which is the memory bandwidth, how many gigabytes per second you need to read, but also the time for each data element to be transferred, that's the memory latency. So, um, you know, you may be able to transfer data at a high rate, but if you have to wait a long time for each individual element, uh, for the first element to come through, that could be an issue. And uh, different, um, different um, computational problems are sensitive to different different uh, features in, this, in, this, in, these, um, in this, this classification. But different architectures address different features. So what the CPUs do, well, in parallel processing, CPUs, expect, um, CPUs exploit parallel process, processing by having multiple cores. Uh, they try and increase the clock frequency. They try and use memory, the memory bandwidth, but they typically use regular DDR memory. Modern CPUs just use fairly regular off-the-shelf memory, and that has relatively limited, limited bandwidth. And also, the memory latency is very high. So if you try and read data from memory, um, then it's very slow to, to, to arrive. And the way that CPUs um, conquer that is CPUs try not to read and write mem uh, data to memory. So a modern CPU spends a lot of its time trying to keep data local in a fast local cache. So large on-chip low latency caches are the way that CPUs try and solve that, uh, solve that problem. Uh, the reason that the um, the reason that the the, um, the clock frequency is stalled whoops, is just briefly the power of a CPU is is proportional to the clock frequency clock frequency times the square of the voltage. So if you increase the frequency and you want to keep a constant power, you have to decrease the voltage. 
Um, but we've got to the stage where the voltage can't be decreased any more, anymore, because if you decrease the voltage any more, you can't distinguish between a one and a zero. You've got to have a certain difference in between to distinguish a one and a zero, and that's that's actually the engineering reason why clock frequencies have um, have um, uh, have st have stalled. We have a fixed power envelope, but we can't decrease the voltage. And this is a this is a ni quite a nice plot of the the clock frequency against time, and you'll see it stalled around about I've been saying 2005. That's pretty, you know, started it was going up pretty rapidly, and about 2005 it it stalled. And so uh, what we do um, is. Um, we can in in increase the, the performance by increasing parallelism, both on a, a CPU and by using lots of CPUs. Um, and so that's many cores or many operations per core, but we still want to keep the power, um, uh, power as low as possible. And the problem we have with CPUs is they're very general purpose. So they have to do an awful lot of things. And, for example, they spend a lot of time trying to do lots of things which, which are useful for general purpose computing, but not so useful for... Um, for high performance computing. For example, branch prediction. There's a lot of technology that goes into um, modern CPUs to try and cope with the fact that code can take different paths. You want to try and do things like predict which path the code is going to take before you get there, or take both paths. You say, look, I don't know if it's, going to go, if it's going to go left or right. Let, let's go left and right at the same time and just backtrack when we find where we got to. That takes a lot of, um, a lot of um, logic on the chip and a lot of engineering, but it's not particularly useful for, um, for high performance computing where we're doing fairly repetitive operations. So it's fantastic if you're doing compilation, because you know, compilation is a lot of decision making in it, but not for high performance computing. And there's some nice diagrams here to show. Uh, so for high performance computing, we want simple cores, number crunching cores. And so that's the, that's the other reason why you want to have heterogeneous systems. You have a CPU to do all this kind of stuff, your compilation on general, your general data management, and you have a GPU which is only concerned, or some accelerator which is only concerned with floating point operations. Um, and as I, this is just a recap, these, these processes, although we would have loved to have developed them in five forms computing, the market simply isn't large enough, but the games industry has become enormous and that's generated the, the, um, the commercial incentive to, to, to develop these processors. So the two major GPU vendors are uh, NVIDIA and AMD, uh, both of which have started to tailor them towards the, the HPC market, um, but NVIDIA is the one which is most popular at the moment in high performance computing. I mean, you may hear, it, Intel has also brought out other chips um, which take the same approach. They use a large number of fairly simple cores. Um, it's slightly confusing because uh, the original, the, the, the architecture was called MIC, many integrated cores. It's essentially a many core CPU with a, maybe a hundred or so cores per chip. Um, the reason it's slight, the terminology is slightly confusing is that the, the early generations of this chip, um, the Xeon Phi, which were called um, uh, Knight's Corner, um, up, to, up to Knight's Corner, uh, couldn't self-host. They looked like accelerators because you needed a CPU to, to, to manage your system, and the, the Xeon, pro the, 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 the many integrated core processor, the Intel processor, looked like an accelerator. It's slightly like confusing now because the most recent uh, chip, the Knight's Landing, is also a self-hosting CPU. So in some sense, it's calling, I think calling this Xeon the, the Fire architecture an accelerator is somewhat um, misleading. They're really um, very large multi-core chips, where the numbers are in the hundreds of cores per chip rather than the tens you might get in a normal machine. But they, do it, they are able to do that because they do use simplified cores. The cores are quite simple and therefore small and, 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 and use a small amount of power. But if you take, this was the chip which was in the, pr the predecessor to Archer, which was Hector. It was a fairly standard AMD, um, Intel compatible, AMD used to um, make um, sort of x86 Intel compatible uh, processors. And there's a 12 core CPU. And if you look at it, the pink is actually, you can count them 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 cores. Um, a large um, area of the silicon is actually devoted to things which aren't the, 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 the compute, you know, thing that actually adds and subtracts and multiplies and divides for floating point numbers. But if you go to something like uh, the Pascal GPU, which is a, a relatively recent um, GPU from NVIDIA, you'll see that the amount of area is much, much higher. And here we have 64, they're called um, um, SMs, 
uh, streaming multiprocessors. But the important point here is that a lot, much, much higher fraction of, of, of the, the silicon is devoted to, to doing the things we're interested in in high performance computing, adding, subtracting, multiplying uh, floating point numbers. And also, uh, memory bandwidth, um, GPUs have developed their own high performance memory, high bandwidth memory, sorry, GPU memory. CPUs use DRAM, and uh, graphic, uh, graphics processors have their own, uh, their own um, special high, high bandwidth memory. And so they, they have the two, they, they overcome two of the challenges we have in high performance computing, which is getting enough floating point operations per second and reading enough data. And so uh, for a GPU, the way it attacks parallel processing is they, have, they take the parallelism to a much higher level and they have thousands of cores. The clock frequency is actually not that high. The clock frequency is kept relatively low to keep the power consumption under control. But the, the, the actual aggregate performance comes from having a large number of, of, of cores. The memory bandwidth is improved over a, a CPU. The memory latency isn't particularly improved, but, what, but we can hide it. Because as I said, the way that the GPUs, so the way you try and hide memory latency on a CPU is you have extra memory, cache memory, which is local to each core, where you try and keep recently read or written data close to you. That requires a lot of bookkeeping and a lot of, um, of management. Uh, on, a, on a GPU, what they do is they say, well, what we'll do is if a thread is waiting for memory, we'll just deschedule it and get someone else in. And so they hide memory latency through very high levels of multi-threading which you could try and do, as I said, on a CPU, but doesn't work in practice because swapping threads in and out on a standard CPU um, is, is quite high overhead. And so the latest technology is um, NVIDIA Tesla series and AMD. Um, and as I said, I'll speak mainly here about uh, NVIDIA uh, because those are the ones which are dominant in, in the high performance computing market. So this is a picture of the, uh, you can see, as I said, I'm not a hardware engineer, but you can see that this is really quite a simple architecture, multiplied, replicated many times. Um, and the chip, I'll come back to this later, but the, the chip is partitioned into things called streaming and multiprocessors. Uh, but there are a large number of cores uh, uh, per symmetric multiprocessor. And groups of cores act in lockstep. And so it's actually quite, quite a complicated architecture that, um, Groups, of course, together have to act in lockstep, perform the same instructions on different, uh, on different data elements. And so the actual, the actual variant of how many um, uh, streaming multiprocessors you have and how many cores per streaming multiprocessor does vary, but um, a high-end GPU has thousands of cores. It has thousands of independent processing units. And so this is a, a, just a schematic diagram. And we've seen, this, we've seen this, this graph already. And NVIDIA are, carry, so NVIDIA are carrying on um, with this sort of exponential, hopefully exponential increase in, um, in performance. I'll, um, I'll go, the AMD processors are fairly similar, um, high co compute performance and high bandwidth, but Less widely used because of programming support issues. So you can program, you can write a program which will run in principle on an NVIDIA GPU and an AMD GPU if you use OpenCL. But people, for a variety of reasons, seem to prefer in the high performance computing community seem to prefer CUDA, and that is GP, that is um, um, NVIDIA specific. Um, so you have to extend your language. As you said, the GPUs act as accelerators, and um, one. CUDA is, is quite a dominant um, approach. Extensions to C or C++ and Fortran to give you access to the hardware. OpenCL is there as well. Um, when I say it's verbose, I'm being slightly old-fashioned. I think if you, if you do OpenCL from C++, there's been a lot of tooling done so that, that actually, because of C++ is so extensible, actually a lot of that verbosity is hidden from you in, in quite, quite elegant ways. Um, there are directive-based approaches. So, as I said, if you want to do threaded programming, uh, shared variables, shared memory programming in high-performance computing, we typically use something called OpenMP, where you, you, you add compiler directives to your code, which creates and manages the operation of different threads. That has been extended. OpenMP has been extended. Well, there was an initial, initial 
OpenMP like standard for accelerators called OpenACC, but it was very much an interim, interim thing. And the more recent versions of OpenMP include GPU support in the standard. However, um, the actual implementations of them are so Cray have an implementation, and I think the most recent GCC compilers do have implementations. But um, graphic, G, GPU accelerator support in OpenMP is relatively um, immature. Uh, it will get better, I'm sure, as more people use it. But in the HPC community, a lot of people are still sticking to, to programming in CUDA. And so this is the way they work. Um, the CPU and the GPU are completely separate, but they communicate via PCI Express. So there's an explicit, if you want to take data from the CPU onto the GPU, you have to explicitly communicate it with them. We'll see what the calls are later on. Um, you can put more than one GPU in a system. I won't, I won't go over this. Uh, but the way, that you, um, you, the way that you build a high-performance computer, a parallel computer using GPUs, is that each node, each individual system, has both GPUs and CPUs, and you just string them together with interconnect, like you, know, like you would with any system. So basically, you take a node, which is run by a single operating system, but now the node is heterogeneous, has CPUs and GPUs, and you link lots of them together using some, some interconnect. Um, I mean, you can just slot a GPU card in, into your, in, as long as you've got enough physical space in your workstation, you can just stick a GPU card into your PCI Express slot on your GP on, on your uh, uh, on your workstation if you want the major you just have to have enough power and you can connect servers together but probably more interesting here is uh, the Cray so um, the Cray XK7 is a very very similar architecture to, to, to Archer so the important point about Archer is is um, I don't have a picture of the boards but I remember that the nodes on Archer have 24 cores but physically, that's made up of two 12-core CPUs. So on the board, there are two sockets. And you, on, the, on Archer, each socket has a CPU in it. On the XK7, it's quite simple. One of the sockets has got a GPU in it. So it's actually a very nice system for doing performance comparisons. You have a very clean um, um, this, uh, comparison. Everything is, the, everything is the same, except on one system, Archer, you have 24 cores per node, two 12-core CPUs. On an XK7, you would have one 12 core CPU and then a GPU. And that is, um, so, so outside the node, the architecture is totally the same. The, the network, everything's the same. It's just each node now becomes a heterogeneous system. And so uh, the most, well, most recent, relatively recent um, GPU is the Pascal. And they've comp continued to improve the, uh, the memory performance um, several times faster. They have also introduced a way, um, the performance of data transfer over PCI Express isn't, isn't fantastic. And so there, there is technology in the most um, uh, recent GPUs to more tightly couple the CPU and the GPU. There's something called NVLink, but for reasons I, I don't understand, um, only the IBM Power Series supports NVLink. So um, for most systems which rely on Intel CPUs, um, you don't have this tight coupling. They're still relatively loosely coupled with explicit data transfer over the PCI Express. So just a summary, so GPUs have higher compute memory bandwidth than CPUs. The silicon is dedicated to many simplistic cores. We use high bandwidth graphics uh, memory. Um, the important point is they're not used alone, but in tandem with the CPU. And um, the most common are NVIDIA GPUs. So AMD also have high performance GPUs, but um, they're not widely used um, it's due to programming support. I mean, I mean, NVIDIA were very good at releasing their tools for free. So, you know, the NVIDIA, the CUDA was available for free um, very early on. And one of the nice things about, uh, about programming GPUs is that um, it's very easy to get a system. You have, most, most people can, it's very easy to get hold of a laptop or a desk, desktop with a reasonable GPU in it. So you can actually um, you can actually experiment and play around with GPU programming on relatively everyday systems. And so that I think that, I think it just promoted the community uptake, and then a lot of people got working on it. And so the, the, these these systems scale from from workstations to large scale supercomputers. So um, we're going to we're going to um, um, concentrate on CUDA here, but in fact, um, 
the way it works in OpenCL, or the way you touch over it at the end, it, it, it's conceptually very similar. The, you conceptually, you basically um, you define a computational kernel that operates on a very small piece of data, a single data element, and then you create lots and lots and lots of these kernels which map onto um, threads, and they're executed in parallel. Now, the technology for doing that is different in CUDA and OpenCL, and OpenCL, as I said, is portable, uh, but in fact, the, 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 con the concepts are really relatively um, similar. So, as I said, the traditional languages ca can't cope with GPUs, and CUDA is, a, I think CUDA used to be an acronym which stood for something, but now it's just CUDA. It's a bit like EPCC. EPCC used to stand for Edinburgh Parallel Computing Center, but it doesn't anymore. We're just EPCC. Um, you can program NVIDIA GPUs from C, C++, or Fortran. Um, so there are language extensions for defining these kernels. So within a program, uh, I'll skip over the Fortran um, slides, just because I'm, I'm sure most people are interested in C, C++. Oh, the, the, the conception, there's no different. I'll concentrate on C and C++. There are ways in the language to define a kernel. So you have to be able to say, this is the operation I want to, to do on each individual data element. Then there are ways to, to launch these, and that's not completely straightforward because we saw there was this hierarchy that you had multiple streaming multiprocessors, SMs, and with each of these you had lots and lots of threads. And um, even underneath that, there are ba batches of these threads which have to execute um, the same instruction at the same time. And so um, even having defined the kernel, you need ways to launch them in different ways. We'll cover that. And also, you need to do memory management. You need to be able to say, I want to allocate some memory on the CPU. No, I want to allocate some memory on the GPU. I want to transfer memory from the CPU to the GPU or from the GPU to the CPU. So all these things need to be supported. And so um, the way it works is you have your CPU, which runs the main program code. And your key routines, you have to define kernels. Now that, so you write one program. You write a single program. Within that program, it actually has two, really two logically different parts. One is the original CPU code, but also it defines the code which is going to execute on the GPU. And these are these kernels, which are then offloaded to the GPU and executed on the GPU. And so you're, uh, for the key in terms of performance, um, if you identified the performance limiting parts of your code, you will then want to um, implement them on the GPU, which involve writing kernels, which CUDA will automatically offload onto the GPU. And then you have to manage the data transfer as well. So uh, we've seen this diagram before, but I'll go into it in a bit more detail. Uh, the, the idea is that you, you, just, you, you um, decompose your data set into a stream of elements. So the idea here is that you have a large amount of data and you want to apply the same operation to each data element. Um, and that is, as I said, true of a large number of, of problems. Um, and um, in, your, in a standard, in a graphics library, these would correspond to your pixels, the, the, the rendered pixels on the screen. But in a high performance computing, a scientific computing context, they could be the cells of our traffic model. They could be the, the areas the areas of your, um, of your um, weather model, your climate model, the individual patches of, of, of land that you're working on. And so a single computational kernel operates on each element. And each of these, the operation of a computational kernel on a single element in, in GPU speak is called a thread. It's the execution of a kernel on one data element. But multiple cores can access multiple elements in parallel. And so there's many threads running in parallel. And so it's suitable instead of data parallel problems. And so um, there's this two-level hierarchy on, on, um, on NVIDIA GPUs. We have multiple streaming multiprocessors, maybe four here, and there's six, there's, and then um, we have a large, for each of these stream multiprocessors, we have a large number of um, cores or CUDA cores uh, across, um, across these. If you look at the, um, the core here means something slightly different. Um, the, um, each core here is very, very simple. So if you look at the top 500 list and um, you look at the number of cores, in the top 500 list it tries to characterize the architecture. If you look at the number of cores for a high-end uh, GPU supercomputer, an accelerated supercomputer, it won't be 
um, billions, um, they count each of these as a core. So I think they've decided that the closest, the closest thing on a GPU to a CPU core is one of these streaming multiprocessors. However, in GPU speak, each of these contains lots and lots of simple cores. So it's a bit of a... Uh, the terminology would be a bit confusing if you're, used to, if you're more used to CPUs. And so, uh, although this is the way that it, it's physically looked, in CUDA there's an abstraction into um, a grid of thread blocks. So basically, um, the, the way to think of in CUDA, your, each thread block is effectively mapping onto one of these streaming multiprocessors. That, that's, that, that's the mapping. So the, the model isn't particularly uh, highly abstracted, basically. But when you hear the word thread block in CUDA terminology, you're thinking about one of these streaming multiprocessors, which has, large, which has potentially hundreds of, of, of individual cores in it. And in CUDA, um, there, this, is, this is a 3D grid, which I think is a little bit ugly, but that's how it is. So if you want to do a 2D problem, you just ignore one of the dimensions. On a 1D problem, you ignore two of the dimensions. But fundamentally, it's a 3D, it's a 3D block. Each block in a grid contains th multiple threads. And the threads are the abstraction of the, of the cores. So the blocks are the abstraction of the, of the, um, of, uh, the streaming multiprocessors. And the, uh, the threads map onto the cores. Now, you don't need to know the exact details. Um, for two, well, first of all, because we, 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 we oversubscribe. And so the fundamental of the GPU model uh, works by having a large number, a much higher number of these virtual blocks and uh, virtual threads than there are physical blocks and physical cores to hide memory latency. Whenever the GPU is executing things, if you're stalled on reading or writing from data, that thread can be descheduled, or those threads can be descheduled and, and, and uh, filled up with some other work, which is not still to be done. So we use more blocks than SMs and more threads than cores. However, it's very, if you want to get very good performance from your uh, program, uh, you need to tune that. So the program will work correctly with, a large, with very different numbers of, 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 um, of configurations of, of your uh, threads into blocks and, and uh, sorry, of your, of your kernels between blocks of threads and cores, but the performance um, may, um, may be dramatically different. So when you write GPU programs, what you spend a lot of time you're doing is playing around with these parameters to try and optimize the performance. So in principle, you would like to use a higher level abstraction where that was hidden from you and the compiler, for example, picked the right choices. Uh, but at, at, at the moment, um, it's not very easy to do that. So people seem to prefer the lower level version where you have control over all these things. So this is DIM3 type, which corresponds to these thread blocks. And um, in C, you'll just say, you would just say DIM3, my x, y, z values, x value, y value, z value. So this is, um, your, this is your array of, of, uh, of thread blocks. And within that, each, each, you can, you can uh, run time, you can work out which one you are by dereferencing. So basically, um, sorry, uh, you can, you can, sorry, you can inquire the sizes. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm confusing my terminology. You, you define this thing, and then once you've defined it, um, the values are stored. So if I have my x, y, z values equals dim 3, 6, 4, 12, then uh, my x, y, z values dot x gives me uh, the 6, or my x, y values dot uh, z gives me the 12. And so this new type is just, uh, uh, just, just uh, describes how your thread blocks are arranged. And so just uh, the last thing I'll do is to sort of illustrate the programming model. Alan came up with this nice example, I think, of the CUDA Hotel. Which looks like a relatively, relatively nice hotel. Um, so you check into your hotel as to your. So this, this, this is an example just to illustrate the kind of a, approach you have to take uh, when when parallelizing a program using um, this this streaming view, this data parallel view. You check into your hotel as to your classmates, and the rooms are allocated in order. So there's a hundred rooms, for example, and you all go to the first rooms one to fifty. Um, then you realise the hotel's only half full. And so, rather than, 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 than it would be much nicer if people had every other room so that there was less noise. So you want to now move from room I to room 2I. If you're in room 2, you want to move to room 4. If you're in room 10, you want to move to, move, uh, to, um, 
uh, to move to room 20. So the serial solution is that the receptionist basically in serial, which the serial would go through the, the book and, and work out the mapping from I to 2I. Okay? So that would be your serial solution. So that's basically saying I will loop through each um, element and apply an operation to it serially. However, the way that, um, the way that you do um, operations in this data parallel streaming model is you define what the operation is locally, what does element I have to do, and then you get everyone to do it, do it at once. And so the, um, in the parallel solution, at least in this, in this um, data parallel or uh, streaming model, is to say, well, the kernel is everyone has to check your room number, multiply it by two, and move to that room, okay? So everyone is doing the same operation, check your room number, multiply it by two, and move it to that room. But, but by doing it, so everyone is executing the same kernel, but of course they're using different data. The, the, the different data is what room number you're starting from, which will turn out to be the equivalent of your, your some thread index, some from thread ID. But you do that in parallel by broadcasting it. You basically tell everyone to do that at once. And so everyone is doing the same operation, but they each do different things because they're applying that operation to different data. Okay. And so uh, the serial solution, i equals 0, i less than i, i double plus, result i equals 2 times i, we can parallelize this by assigning each iteration to a separate CUDA thread. And I'll stop there because the next, we're starting to get on to um, CUDA specifics, so that's a good place to stop. But it is very much, um, it's kind of a, it's kind of a different model. Uh, normally you would do, you loop through the elements and say, what should I do on each element? And in principle, you could do a different thing on each element. However, if you know you're doing the same thing on each element, you can take a different operation. You can define the operation on each element and then tell everyone to do it. And that's the way that, um, that the and GPUs are good at that. The hardware in GPUs is designed to be able to good at do that, doing that kind of thing, getting lots of threads to op do the same operation at the same time. And the way that CUDA works is it just gives you the mechanism for defining what these kernels are, um, mapping the kernels to the threads and managing data transfer. So at half past three after the break, I'll come back and sort of illustrate how this general model is actually implemented in parallel in CUDA. I, I find the CUDA syntax a bit clunky, um, a bit grungy, um, but it works and it, uh, it seems to get good performance. Um, and as I said, although there are other models, um, Either they're conceptually similar, OpenCL is conceptually similar, but maybe higher level to make it more portable. But even things like the directive-based approaches, although they can look a lot higher level, have a lot more higher levels of abstraction, currently, unless you understand what is happening at the very low level, then you won't get good performance. So even to program, current, this may change as compilers get better, but currently, if you write a quite a naive high-level um, program using these OpenACC or the new OpenMP directives, you could potentially you'll get a potentially get a correct program that performs very poorly. If you understand what's going on under the hood, how it's actually going to be creating kernels and assigning them to thread blocks and threads, then you can write your higher-level code in a way which generates efficient lower-level code. And so we're kind of in the situation we were maybe 20 years ago with writing high-performance serial code, where you had to kind of understand how a chip worked to write C or Fortran for, to force the compiler to write, to generate efficient code. Nowadays, compilers are much better at generating efficient code from any kind of source you might write. We're still at that situation for performance in GPUs. So even if you're never going to use CUDA, it's actually useful understanding the model so that when you program in these higher level, um, uh, higher level programming models, you will understand what, what is and isn't likely to give you good performance. So as I said, we, I'll start again at the next slide, slide 14, uh, after the, 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 um, the break. I'll come back at half past three, BST. And if I have time, I might give a few of the slides I hadn't planned to give, but um, there are things you can do. If you do things wrong in GPU programming, your performance can go down by orders of magnitude. So I'll maybe touch on the first few slides from a slide set that Alma has on, on performance optimization, because there's a few high level things you need. You, if you understand them, it again allows you to write efficient code. Okay, so, um, so what this example illustrated is um, the way that what we're going to do is we're going to take simple operations here, multiplying a number by two, and we're going to parallelize it. So there's a number of steps here. Clearly, the first thing you have to do is define the kernel, and that's what we've done here. We said the kernel is everybody check your room number, multiply it by two, and move to that room. However, there's a number of questions 
you might ask. One is you might say, well, how do people find out what their room number is? That's the local, that's the data which is different on each thread. And how do we take this kernel and distribute it across the thread? And that's the sort of tooling that CUDA gives you. So this is the serial solution, i equals 0, i less than n, i double plus, result i equals 2i. In, in CUDA, what do you do to do that? Well, first of all, you take your elemental operation and you, you cast it as a kernel, which is a function. So you have to define a function here, I've called it my kernel, which um, takes an array result, here a pointer, but it's the same, it takes an array result and it multiplies it by two. So the function you've defined only operates a single element and the, the, um, the operation is result of i equals two times i. However, um, we have to find out, we have to do a mapping between the threads and the data. And the way that's done is every kernel has this magic uh, variable associated with it called thread, I, th thread index, which you don't define, it just exists. And you can dereference it. So thread idx.x gives me um, my position in, this, in a 3D um, um, a grid of, of threads. Now we're only doing a, a, 1D, um, a 1D grid, so we're not con concerned about X, Y, and Z if we just have a linear space. So what this is doing is here is this is giving you a thread number and your operate thread i is operating on array element i. So, so it may seem a kind of fairly um, trivial piece of code, but it's important to understand what's happening. As I said, this is an elemental operation which is only designed to, to operate on a single element. You wrap it up in a kernel, so you do result i equals 2 times i. Then you have to decide what's the mapping between a thread and the array index. Well, what we do here is we just we, we can work out what our thread index is through this magic variable thread idx dot x, and we assign that to be the we're saying that that um, that the thread x works on operate works on um, array element i. So you replace the loop with a function. You add this global specifier, which says this is a GPU kernel. So when you compile this, this will be co compiled differently. It will be compiled to produce code for the GPU, not for the CPU. And there's this internal magic variable thread index, which is actually a dim 3D type, um, which actually gives you the X, Y, and Z um, um, positions in the grid, but we're only using a 1D decomposition. But that, so, so we've defined the kernel, but we haven't actually launched it yet. So the way you launch it is uh, using a strange, well, using a syntax of, of, of triple chevrons. So what you do is you say, you say, my, you have an array result and you operate it with, with my kernel. So you want, I want my kernel to operate on result, okay? And we've defined what that does. These two variables here, blocks per grid and threads per block, tell you how you map the threads onto the GPU architecture. So um, what, what, we're going to, what we're going to say is we have to decide how we're going to, trying to go back to the diagram, we have to decide how we distribute our threads between these blocks or the, the, on hardware they're streaming multiprocessors, how many threads are we going to give to each block. Okay. And so that's done by this syntax. When you launch them, you say how many blocks per grid there are and how many threads per block. Well, let's just use one block. Okay, let's keep it simple. So we're not going to use it. In that diagram, I had four, four blocks, four streaming multiprocessors. We're just going to use one of them. And that means we have to use n threads in the block because we want to have... So we, we, if the array is of length n... Each thread is only operating on one element. We need to have n threads to, 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 um, um, to process all the elements. So this is saying, please launch n threads. Okay? So run this kernel on n threads. But then you have to decide how you distribute them. And we're saying we want all n threads on one block. So it's a slightly, it's a slightly different way of thinking. But you've defined this kernel, and then you have to, to... So this is how you can see that CUDA isn't particularly highly abstracted. You know, you would never have come up with this model unless you knew that your GPU had this hierarchy of blocks and threads per block. Uh, but it allows you to control these two, two separately. And so um, there's a large number of combination of blocks per grid and threads per block which will give you the correct answer. 
And it's these parameters that you vary um, to, to try and get performance. And there's four trying, uh, there are four trying, um examples here, but the four is exactly the same. In, con, in, con, in principle, the syntax is just slightly different. So pre previously, we only used one block, okay? one streaming multiprocessor. So performance is going to be poor. What we want to do is we want to use, a lot, we want to use lots of streaming multiprocessors. So for example, if I wanted to run that code on 256, um, um, sorry, if I, had, if I wanted to run it on more than one block, what I could do is rather than saying I'm going to run all n threads on one block, I can say I'm going to run 256 threads on each block and then use as many blocks as, as is required to make up all, the, all of the n um, all of the n threads. So, um, sorry, I've skipped two things here. Um, sorry, I was touching. Sorry, this is the slide. So we've got the same kernel as before. It's important. It's the same kernel. The elemental operation is the same. Result i equals two times i. Um, oops. Yeah. Um, but now, if I want to, to use multiple blocks, I can say, well, you might know for hardware reasons that 256 threads per block is the right thing to do. So the threads per block is 256, but to make up n, you have to uh, distribute them over the right number of blocks, which as long as the division works out, is n over 256. So you create an array, dim three blocks. So imagine n was 1024 then dim three blocks per grid would be four, zero, four, one, one, say I want to use four blocks, and then you'd have 256 threads on each block. Now, actually, this isn't the same code. Sorry, I, I jumped ahead. Um, not only can you add, your thread ID is only, um, it is only um, um, a unique within a block, okay? So you, have, you might have thread three and block zero and thread three and block one. To work out a globally unique value of i, you have to multiply it up by which, which, um, which block you are. So it's, it's sort of quite low level and clunky, but what you say is, if I have a number of blocks, um, then um, I get a block index, which corresponds to block zero, one, two, three. Block dim dot x is telling me how many threads there are in each block, and then I add this on here to get my local copy. All this is doing is saying, if I go back to the diagram, if I have 256 threads per block, then they're numbered here from 0 to 255. This one, if this is block 1, then the block index will be 1. I multiply it by 256. That starts off of 256. Then I add my local thread ID to that. It gets 256 to 511. Down here will be 512 to 767. So again, it's, it's quite low level because you have to manually work this thing out. But what CUDA does is it tells you which block you're on and which thread you are within that block. And if you multiply these things and add them together correctly, you can come up with a single index i, which linearly spans the space. And so here, I would actually say, OK, I want 256 threads per block, and I want n over 256 blocks to make up the total number of n. And when I launch it, I say, again, blocks per grid and threads per block. And again, these are the kind of parameters you alter. So this code, modulo the fact that the numbers need to divide out correctly, this code will give you the, the correct answer for a large number of combinations of these two parameters. The question is, what is the combination which gives you the, the, the fastest performance? And that's the kind of thing which currently requires intuition, experimentation, or automation. Ideally, you'd like a compiler to be able to analyze the code and work this out. At the moment, we're not quite there yet. So what a lot of people do is they have auto-tuning frameworks which will run the code on large numbers of combinations of these, uh, of these variables to work out what the, um, uh, what the, uh, the most efficient um, combination is. Fortran is exactly the same. So a more realistic example is vector addition. Okay, you might have two vectors, a, b, and c, and you want to do c equals a plus b. Your normal c code would be for i equals naught, i less than n, i double plus c, i equals a, i plus b, i. But again, if we're distributing the threads over these blocks in a linear fashion, then we can work out um, a, a linear, we can map the thread index to this i in a simple way. We multiply our block and index for the size of each block and add on a local thread index to get a unique value of i and then we do the addition. So again, if I do 256 threads per block and n over 256 um, um, blocks per grid, if n was 1024 then this would be 4 
And so block IDX.x might be 0, 1, 2, or 3, corresponding to the four streaming multiprocessors. And thread ID, this block dim.x would be 256, and thread ID.x would also be uh, between 0 and 255. So if you multiply them together and add them across the SMs, we get a global ID which goes from 0 to 1024. Again, in four channels, it's the same syntax. So um, the, um, the internal variables which we end up using all the time are block dim x, which tells you the number of threads per block. And that's inherited from the, when you inv invoke it, you specify a number. But within the kernel, you query that number through this, through this uh, structure, block dim dot x. Thread id dot x is unique to each thread in a block, and with 0 to 255 in the previous example. And block id dot x is unique to every block which numbers the blocks. So block ID or X numbers the blocks. Thread ID or X um, uh, references a thread within a block, and you can multiply them up to come out with a unique, unique identifier. So it feels quite old-fashioned. It feels like the old way of doing a 2D array as a 1D array and, you know, multiplying up, you know, um, you know, um, I, you do, do you know, um, Local index is i times n plus j, or, or something like that. It's, it's, it's the same kind of idea. Uh, and in 4 it's the same. You can do 2D and 3D examples. So although so this structure, this, 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 um, both um, decompositions, the number of blocks and the threads per block, uh, sorry, the threads on each block can actually have a 3D structure. I was just using a 1D structure before. So if we wanted to do a matrix addition, of two, three arrays A, B, C, C, I, J equals A, I, J plus B, I, J. What I have to do is I have to take these, these, these values uh, for my, if I use a 2D decomposition, my X and Y position in the grids and map them onto I and J in a way which spans the whole space. So the obvious thing to do is just a generalization. My J index is my, the, my, my X block index times the size of the X block plus my local X index, my I, is my y block index times the blocks um, times the, the size in the y direction plus my y thread index, and I do cij equals aij plus bij. And again, when we launch these things, we now have to specify. I was, previously, I restricted ourselves to 1D decomposition. Here we're doing a 2D. So again, assuming everything divides exactly, I want to have 16 by 16 uh, grid threads per block. So I still have 256 threads per block, but now I'm thinking them as being arranged as a 16 by 16 grid, which maps more naturally onto my, my 2D problem. And then I've decided to, 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 to arrange them in n over 16 by n over 16 uh, a block. And if that all, if, if that all works out, uh, um, if everything is, is um, divides equally, that will span the space. Of course, it doesn't rely on the numbers being divisible by each other, but it's just a bit more um, messing around and, and, and bookkeeping if you don't have exactly divi divisible. And when I launch this, it's the same thing. Matrix add blocks per grid, threads per block, A, B, C. So here what I'm saying, again, is on each streaming multiprocessor, I'm having 256 threads, which I'm thinking is being arranged in a 60 by 16 grid. And then I'm arranging them um, in a... I'm arranging them if, if um, n was 1,024, I'd be arranging them in, um, sorry, if n was something like, well, if n was 1,024, it's 1,024 by 1,024 matrix, then the grid would be uh, 64 by 64. And the same thing in Forshine, if you're interested. So that's basically uh, the way that, that, it, that, it, that, um, that the mapping the, the, the basic kernels work. I think I'll go back to this diagram just to make it more obvious. You decide how you launch the kernel across these SMs, and how many, so you see how many threads you want per SM, and then you try and use multiple SMs to make sure that you have enough threads. But you don't, you're not restricted to 1D decomposition. For convenience, you can have 2D and 3D decompositions. And within the kernel, there are these magic variables which allow you to query how big is the decomposition in each dimension and where am I, both where am I in my block index, where am I in this grid, and then once you know where you are, you need to know where you are in this grid. So this, this, this is a natural map to that matrix operation where we had 2D grids we consider the blocks to be in a 2D grid and the threads to be in a 2D grid within each block. And in that example, this was 16 by 16, i.e. 256. And then we had a larger, um, we'd had a larger grid here. So we had a, uh, we had a, a number of, 
a number of blocks of threads uh, to make up the total number of, of atoms. So that's 2D, and you can do 3D as well, um, but that, uh, that's just a bit more code. So the other, the other important point is the GPU and the CPU have separate memory. The data you access in the kernels has to be on the GPU memory, so they need to be explicitly managed. And so there's a simple route, well, there's a routine called CUDA malloc, just like malloc, which allocates GPU memory. So CUDA malloc uh, mallocs um, an array um, um, of memory on um, a block of memory in, in the GPU memory, and it's... it's uh, Slightly different syntax from malloc. You pass a pointer rather than the return value. But if you want to allocate a size of a floating array of size n, you do CUDA malloc address of a n times size of float, and then you can free it again. And that's just explicit memory allocation on the GPU. So once you've allocated memory on the GPU, how do you get data onto it? Well, you use CUDA mem copy. So you do host to device. So CUDA mem copy takes an array device, array on the device an array on the host, and if you do CUDA mem copy host to device, that goes from the host to the device, um, but it goes from uh, the other way around, you specify the array on the host, the array on the device, and CUDA mem copy device to host. So it's slightly weird that um, you have to swap these around, but the way is that the first argument is always the destination. Okay? The first argument is always the destination. So it's destination source, and you have to tell uh, the copy routine where they're located. You have to tell it which is which. Okay. And actually, you can use CUDA mem pop copy to copy memory on the GPU if you want to. So you can do CUDA mem copy device to device if you want to do that. Again, it's all specified in bytes. It's just fairly low level stuff. So, but this allows you to say have a data on the host, copy it to the device, which is the GPU. So the host is the CPU. The device here is the GPU copy from the host to the device. You can then launch all the kernels on the data, and then when you want the results, you want to, you can copy it back again. Uh, in Fortran, it's it's wrapped up in a slightly easier syntax, but it's it's exactly the, the same thing. It's important to realise that the kernels uh, the kernel calls are non-blocking. The host program continues immediately after it calls the kernel. So when you execute um, um, a um, an operation like vector add blocks per grid, threads per block ABC. This initiates the kernel, but it returns a control to the to the to the host, which is the CPU immediately. So that allows you to, to overlap computation on the CPU and the GPU, which can be quite useful. However, at some point you want you want to know you you have to um, wait until the calculation is finished. So that's when you can use the result. So CUDA thread synchronize will wait for this kernel to finish. Okay. So if you want to overlap work on the host with work on the, um, on the device, on the GPU, first of all, you have to find out work which is independent of the result here, C, but you can do vector add. This initiates the, 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 the GPU computation. You can then do something on the host, which doesn't depend on the result, and then synchronize, could have thread synchronize, wait for the kernel to finish. Uh, the CUDA mem copy calls are blocking, it's standard calls of blocking that they only return once the operation is completed. Again, if you want to really improve performance, because memory transfer can be an overhead, uh, there are non-blocking variants. So you might want to initiate the copy early on, as, and then and then and then wait for it to complete later on. Um, you can synchronize threads within a kernel. It's not something that you really do a lot. I mean, really what you're trying to do is parallelize a simple operation where all the um, iterations, all the, all the the calculations for any value of i are independent from each other. However, uh, you can synchronize threads, but this is where, again, the abstraction level is, is not really very high. Only threads in the same block can communicate. So, so, so you can only synchronize two threads which are in the same block. Again, for an abstract product programming model, that seems a bit of a random thing to, to random restriction, but of course it maps onto the architecture. You have these SM streaming multiprocessors which map onto blocks. Clearly, these streaming multiprocessors are a single unit which are unable to do apparently able to do synchronization internally, but not between each other, and that's where this comes from. So, but it's not possible to communicate between different blocks in a kernel. So you have to exit the kernel and start a new one. So a slightly contrived example was if you wanted the zeros thread to set a value to x, 
and the first thread to read it from the same array, then you would have to put a sync thread in here. But I have to say, in practice, you tend not to do this. What you're trying, you're trying to accelerate calculations which are parallel across all values of i, and therefore there's no communication between any of the, of the threads within a, uh, within a single kernel. If you do need to communicate within the threads in a the kernel, then it matters quite a lot as to whether the threads are on the same, in the same block or in different blocks, whether on the same SM or different SMs. Um, there is some unified memory uh, where, um, where you can uh, let the, um, the uh, runtime system copy data when it needs to. There could be memory which is shared logically between the CPU and the GPU, uh, and, but it can be quite slow, it's, uh, but it can be a good way to parallelize code quickly. If you want to get code up and running quickly, you can declare arrays in, in unified memory, and therefore you can operate on them from the CPU or the GPU at will without having to do explicit copies, but probably to get performance, you're going to have to manage that memory uh, by hand later on. And so um, there's a bit of an example here for... Um, for um, if, you do, if you have an array and you malloc in CUDA malloc, CUDA malloc managed, then the array can be accessed on either the host or the device. And the transfer will happen automatically as and when it's needed. However, that's not necessarily the most efficient thing to do. Um, so if you want to do something more, um, more sophisticated, uh, you, so we, we talked about how these architectures um, were actually built, how you build a, a very large parallel supercomputer. You take a large bunch of nodes, which like Archer currently have two CPUs per node. You take out one of the CPUs and you stick in a GPU. So clear, clearly you there you need to be able to communicate between the nodes. How do two GPUs um, communicate um, uh, between, between each other? So the way it works is really quite... Um, so, what you do is, if you're doing a message passing programming, you set the number of MPI tasks equal to the number of nodes. So, you have one process, typically, uh, on each node. So, you will have one, one process running on each, on a, each host CPU, and then that, that process will then offload data to and from the GPU. So, each MPI task controls its own GPU. That's probably the simplest thing to do. And if you want parallelism, if you have a multi-core CPU and you want to do parallelism there, you're probably better to do it with threads. So you might do OpenMP threading on the CPU and offload stuff to the GPU if you really wanted to use up the... the um. I mean, that is one of the problems with this architecture, that you have to have a host CPU, okay? But if you have a very, very highly um, parallel program, then you will offload almost all the calculation onto the GPU. But modern CPUs are quite powerful, so you have this, you have this sort of... You might think of it as parasitic CPU, which is there really just to manage the GPU, but it's very, very powerful. On a machine like Archer, it would have 12 cores. And so it's not... The, I think the argument is if you get the entire calculation onto the GPU, then the GPU is probably four or five times faster than the entire CPU, so you don't really care. But in the intermediate part, where there is, you know, some of the code on the GPU and some on the CPU, you end up having to sort of parallelize twice. You want to take the parallel code which runs for the GPU, but you also want to use all the, um, all the cores on the CPU. Um, MPI communications, the, way, the naive way to do it is just to, if, you want, if, you want, if a GPU on one node wants to communicate with the GPU on another node, you could a mem copy the memory from the GPU to the CPU, do an MPI send, a message passing send, and, and, GP, and, and could a mem copy it back again. Um, some MPIs are CUDA aware, um, and they access the, the GPU memory directly. But I think I, might be, I think it's just a matter of they can when they get an address, they can, they know if it's on the CPU or the GPU, and if it's on the GPU, they do a mem copy from the GPU memory. I, I think um, so. The CPU is still involved, but again, it's quite a it's quite a belt and braces um, um, technique um, where basically a lot of things are done manually. Uh, copying data from the CPU for the GPU is manual, and then that is the way that you can transfer data between the GPUs is actually done through the CPU. So you, don't have, you do not have MPI running on the GPUs. MPI runs on the CPUs. Um, okay. How does it work? Well, um, if, you want to, if you want to play around with CUDA, you can get the NVIDIA CUDA compiler 
uh, for free. Um, CUDA Fortran um, is a bit more wrapped up in the compiler. Uh, it's, it, it's, it's not so commonly used. It's wrapped up in the PGI compiler. I think it's an academic. There are free versions. You need to go to the NVIDIA web pages. But definitely you can get the all the tooling you need to do GPU programming with CUDA in C is available for, for free. Um, I mentioned OpenCL. OpenCL um, is a cross-platform framework, and in, it, in, it uh, covers a large range of application architectures. In principle, it also in includes GPUs. So the advantage of using OpenCL over CUDA is that it would run on NVIDIA and AMD devices. If you do CUDA, you could only run on NVIDIA devices. If you have OpenCL, it will run on both. Um, NVIDIA do support OpenCL, but they put a lot of a lot of more effort into um, into CUDA. But they're really they're very similar. They're similar abstractions and similar functionality. So, for example, the threads might be different. Uh, CUDA had, sorry, the terminology might be different. CUDA calls them threads. OpenCL calls them work items. Um, there's more work for the programmer in OpenCL. You have to do a lot more setup. Although, as I said, I understand, although I'm not an expert, that the modern C++ interface, a lot of that can be abstracted away, and, and you get a lot of it for free. Um, but maybe obviously I will catch up with CUDA. Um, there's no in principle reason why it should be less efficient. It's just that they have to be more general. They have to support more platforms. Therefore, it's harder to be as efficient on a particular platform like, um, like an NVIDIA GPU. Um, so, you know, this, that's, the, that's sort of the, the, the summary. Traditional languages don't cope with GPUs because you have to have different code for the CPU and the GPU. CUDA allows you to do that by you mark up sections of your code as being for the GPU, and the compiler will compile them independently and produce GPU executables. And then there's CUDA functionality. There's APIs for basically executing these kernels on the GPU and defining them. Each kernel is only op in, um, executed by a single thread, and there are ways of how you map um, the threads to your, your, your the, the physical threads to your index space by these this, this sort of coordinate system of blocks which correspond to the streaming multiprocessors and threads which correspond to the, the to the to the, the CUDA threads within a block. Um, and as I said, OpenCL is really a similar the concepts are very similar between the two, but it's less mature, at least for NVIDIA, but more portable. So um, I thought that, given that I'm running slight, I actually had a bit of extra time, I would give one quick lecture on, um, on optimization. Now, the standard, the standard um, statement, which is, which is often true, I can't remember the exact statement, but you really, really should look at optimizing code early on. Okay? You should write correct functional code, and then you should worry about its performance later on. However... There are a couple of things, and one thing in particular in GPU program, which have such a large effect on the performance of your code. Well, there are two things which have such a large effect on the performance of your code, you really need to think about them up front. So it is definitely worth thinking about those quite early on. So, um, again, this is one of Alan's, Alan's talks originally. So this is the way that the hardware works. We've talked about this. You have your CPU with its memory. We have this PCI Express connection, which allow, and we can copy data between the two. We have a main program, which is here. By compiling it within, with a CUDA compiler and marking up pieces of your code, the kernels will be compiled for the GPU. And then we have this two-level hierarchy, both in hardware and in the model, that we have lots of uh, physical streaming multiprocessors. And in the CUDA model, they're called thread blocks. And then with each block, with each streaming multiprocessor, we have a lot of physical pieces of hardware, uh, CUDA threads, and within the, um, within the, um, the model, um, they're called, within the uh, CUDA model, they're called threads. And within um, uh, SM, uh, these threads can actually share memory, uh, which is why they're able to synchronize, because they can read and write the same memory. So the, the things which hinder you for GPU performance are um, copying data to and from the device, Device underutilization and that related to GPU memory latency, memory bandwidth and code branching. And I'll go through these relatively briefly, uh, but um, they sort of they're interesting because um, a couple of the a couple well, at least a couple of the hints or key performance tips are completely different from what you in fact completely 
the opposite of what you do on a CPU. And that's why I think they're worth um, mentioning. This is one of the cases where a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. If you've done a lot of CPU code optimization, then you might actually do the wrong thing for a GPU. So we've seen here CPU host and GPU device have separate memories. You have to copy, and that's quite expensive. Again, in a really dedicated architecture, these the GPU and the CPU would be closely coupled. They're not. They're distinct systems joined by a bus, which doesn't have a particularly um, high bandwidth. So you have to minimize the copies. That, sound, that sounds fairly obvious. But you should try and keep data resident on the device. And often what happens is you have... Compu you have pieces of computation which are not performance critical. They don't really take that much time, so you'd like to do them on the CPU. But to do them on the CPU, they need the data. So you'd have to bring the data from the GPU to the CPU, do this simple operation, and then take the data from the CPU back to the GPU. So often you end up um, doing things which are not particularly elegant, but you need to do them for, for performance. And the two things you might do are put a kernel on the GPU which isn't particularly efficient, but at least it's much quicker to do it on the GPU than to bring the data back to the CPU and then take it across. Or the other thing you sometimes do is actually recalculating things. It's sometimes quicker to recalculate something than to copy it from the host. So uh, just a simple example, if you've got a loop over time steps, you have some inexpensive routine on the host, which updates the host data. You copy the data from the host to the device. You have some computationally expensive routine on the device, but then you have to copy data back from the device to the host to do this another routine here. Although this routine, as its name would suggest, doesn't take much time, to, to run it on the CPU requires the data to be copied back, and that's not a good thing to do. And so you might copy the host from, from the host device at the start and then port this inexpensive routine to the device. And it may be, you know, you may say, well, that's a crazy routine to run on the GPU. It's really not, but, but, but at least if you do it on the GPU, it saves you a copy. Again, in the future, we might hope that with more integration between CPU and GPU, you can decide, um, um, you, can, you can run the code in the, um, on, on, the, on the most appropriate device. But because data copying is explicit and slow, you need to play these tricks. The second thing is parallelism. GPU performance relies on using many threads. And as I said, in normal parallel programming, uh, classical parallel programming for scientific and technical programs, the art is to manually decompose the problem into the right number of threads. So if you have 16 uh, physical threads on your multi-core CPU, you want to find 16 things to do because you want to map them one to one from um, onto the threads. You don't want to run more than 16 physical. You want to run more than 16 operating system threads because that's inefficient. However, on the GPU, you want to have many more threads uh, than uh, you want to have many more software threads than there are physical cores to allow things to memory latencies to be hidden. And so, um, a couple of examples of that. First of all, as I said, the programmer decomposes the loops. You have to have at least as many um, uh, threads as there are physical cores. But what you actually want is more threads than more cores. Uh, sorry, many more threads than there are cores, because this allows you to handle the, um, the, handle the latency, to hide the latency. Because the bottom comment there is the important one. NVIDIA GPUs have very fast thread switching and support many concurrent threads, which is not really true of modern CPUs. So, for example, if you had a loop which went from I to 512 and J to 512, you might, for simplicity, you might say, what I'll do is I'll split the I loop over threads, but I'll have each thread do all the J loop. Okay? So each, I'm splitting the I loop over the threads, but each thread is responsible for all the J iterations. That gives you 512 threads. So for a CPU code, that would be fine. That's, that's way more parallels than you need. Okay? However, on the GPU, this is not enough. And so on a GPU, you would want to calculate the I and the J from the thread block and have independent iterations. You would want to map each individual iteration, the operation on a single element, I, J, to a different thread. And so typically, the granularity of parallelization in GPU programming is much finer than you would, you would do in a CPU program. You want to find a large, large number. And for a CPU program, you would say, well, I don't want tiny little pieces of work to do. The overheads will be too, too, way too big. 
but on a GPU, you want to go to that really low level of find granularity, find a large number of small tasks to do, and then throw them at the GPU. And so you will tend to decompose. You you're looking for more parallelism. So you want to decompose here over both loops, not just the first loop. Um, but the key one, and this is where a little knowledge, again, um, a, your intuition can, can be deceptive. Um, GPUs have a very high peak memory bandwidth, but it's only achieved when data is exact accessed for multiple threads in a single transaction. This is called memory coalescing. Consecutive threads access consecutive memory locations. So basically, you want, if, you want a th if a thread is accessing data element I, you want the next thread to be accessing I plus 1, I plus 2, I plus 3, I plus 4. You want the threads to, 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 to traverse through the memory in a linear way because that then allows the memory system can then, it's called coalescing, it can take a large number of requests from a whole block of threads and serve them up at once. And that's done very efficiently. So individual accesses to memory aren't particularly fast, but if you can block them up into larger transactions, they're very efficient. But the problem is they have to be blocked up in the correct way. Um, and actually, so adapting code to allow coalescing can dramatically improve performance. It is an absolutely key uh, requirement of, 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 um, of uh, to get efficient GPU codes that memory access is coalesced. And it can be a bit horrible, but you want consecutive threads are those with consecutive values. Thread ID dot X are consecutive. You want consecutive threads to access consecutive memory locations. And that's kind of trivial for, for linear loops. Okay? So if we have a, the, the loop we had before, index is block index dot X times block dim X plus thread ID X dot X. Okay? Output index equals two times input of index. So the index, if I increment the thread index by one, the memory I'm accessing in, in, increases by one in here. Okay, that's kind of trivially obvious. Each thread is accessing thread index dot x, thread index dot x plus one are accessing linear memory. So, for so for a for a one-dimensional for a vector, it's kind of trivial. So this kind of loop is trivially coalesced, and that will mean that the memory system can say, "All right, all those threads are accessing that 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 block of memory. I can get that from memory really really quickly in a single block, and you're all happy." The problem comes when you have multi-dimensional arrays. So in C, if you have an array um, out ij, output ij, then the outermost index runs fastest. What this means that is in memory, output ij is next to output ij plus 1, which is next to output ij plus 2. Okay? So, so you can think of C or C2D arrays as being, of being arrays of arrays, if you want to be that way. But the important point is that, that, that in memory, um, J and J plus 1 and J plus 2 are next to each other. And so if I do this thing here, which seems like a natural thing to do, I'll say, well, I've got this loop. I will split it up over the I index. So each thread will be, will be responsible for a different index I. But then each thread will do the whole J. Okay, so e this is this is the kernel split across i. Each kernel will have a different value of i, but here each kernel is executing a loop over the j's. This is not coalesced because uh, thread thread one is i equals one, which is output one j. Thread two is i equals two, which is output two j. So so i j i plus one j i plus two j are a long way apart in memory. So these are not coalesced, and this code will go much, much slower okay, than you want. So the way to do it, Fortran is the other way around, but I'll skip that, is, um, is to, oops, sorry, um, sorry. The way to do it is, the, is this slide here, is to, um, is to do it the other way around. If we take the C loop and we have a loop over IJ, if we assign the threads to the i index and loop over the j index, we get the wrong, we get we get the correct answer. The code will run very slowly because the memory accesses aren't coalesced. If we split the loop over the j index amongst the threads and have an explicit loop over i, then it is coalesced. So each thread, here you can say that each, if you think about this as a matrix, you could say that each thread is doing a different um, row. Here you could say each thread is doing a different column. And in this, this, in this 
decomposition, where each thread is doing a different column, it means that the access, the access between the different threads are coalesced. Now, the reason this is counterintuitive is that if you are writing this as a, as a loop, a double loop for i, for j, then the right way to write this in, 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 in a normal code would be to have the i loop followed by the j loop. That's the right way to access the memory linearly, which is what you want for cache-based microprocessors. However, the way GPUs work, the J loop, which is here the outermost loop, ha sorry, the J loop should be the outermost loop, and the I loop should be the innermost loop. So that, that's where, if you've done this kind of stuff before, your intuition can go wrong, um, that the, the sort of ordering of loops for, for best memory performance is different in a, in a, in a, a CUDA loop versus a, a normal CPU loop. Again, um, if you want 2D or 3D decompositions, it's just the same, same thing, that basically you have to be careful about how you do it. And here in C, you would split up this way that the, um, uh, you have to just, um, you have to uh, split the loop up in the correct way. And again, J should be, the J index should depend on the, the block index X and the thread index X, and the I index should depend on the block index Y and the thread index Y. And again, this looks counterintuitive, because you, you'd think that I, J should naturally correspond to X, Y, but there's this strange inversion that happens because of this memory coalescing. So I and J should be mapped to Y and X. So again, it's one of these, um, it's one of these things which can be, it can have enormous effects on performance because one of the one of the key features that you're using a GPU is to get this high memory bandwidth. To get high memory bandwidth requires coalescing. There are tools which will spot these things for you. So what you should do, the first thing you should do, whenever you run a um, run a uh, develop a CUDA program, if it's not if it's not running very efficiently, you should use some some of the provided tools, and it will give you statistics on what fraction of your memory accesses were coalesced. And if only a, a small percentage of your memory accesses are coalesced, then you know that's a bad thing to do. Okay. It will also give you um, uh, data for how much data was, sorry, statistics on how much data was transferred between the CPU and the GPU. So those are the two kind of things. It may not be obvious to you looking at the code what's going on, but there are tools which can give you uh, performance metrics which allow you to spot things like too much data transfer between CPU and GPU and non-coalesced memory accesses uh, very quickly. I have to say, I find this unnatural, but the reason it's find it unnatural is I'm, old, I'm an old-fashioned programmer who was used to writing things 20 years ago. Uh, when it really mattered which way around you, you did your for loops, and um, the way you should do them in the CUDA context is different from the way you should do them in a in a in a, in a, in a, a serial context. Modern com for, again for, for for the standard CPU code, if you put your loops in the wrong order, then the modern compiler probably will rearrange them. It will say he's doing he's it's a C code. He's doing he's looping over J then I. That's the wrong way around. I'll I'll spin it round. Okay, just to make him make things better. Of course, you can't do that on the, um, in, in this example because you're making an explicit distinction between how you parallelize. The I loop is parallelized by giving to be given to different threads, and the J loop is serial. So the compiler can't help, even if it, maybe there are tools you can spot this, but the compiler can't help you here because you specify the parallelism explicitly. Uh, the other one is branching. This is the, this is the other places where um, the architecture hits you. Threads are scheduled in groups of 32, which are called warps. Um, this comes actually from, from weaving. There's some, um, each thread, if you think of the way you're making us, if, you, if you're weaving a piece of cloth, then uh, the warp is, this, there's the terminology for warp, which I think is the block of threads is a warp in, when you're weaving, actually physically weaving a scarf or a blanket. But groups, threads of groups of 32 are called warps, and threads within the warp must execute the same instruction in lockstep. So they're on different elements, but they have to execute the same instruction. So this is where this is why your data accesses need to coalesce. All 32 threads in a warp need to be accessing a, need to be doing data access at the same time. But also they need to be the same. They need to be doing the same calculation. So the problem is the CUDA programming model allows you to have branching. It allows you to write a program where the 32 threads in a warp are not doing the same thing, they're doing different things. But all, what it will do is it will serialize it. If half the threads want to do A and half the threads want to do B, it will do all the A's first and all the B's, and so some of the threads will be idle. So branching in, um, branching in CUDA codes is very, very dangerous. 
because it can cause your thread to be serialized. And it's not obvious from the programming model. The programming model gives you this, this illusion that all of the threads are independent. The whole model is based on write a kernel for each thread as if it were completely independent. But at execution, the GPU model actually bunches them up into groups of 32. So all these blocks of 32 threads have to be doing the same thing for you to get an efficient code. So um, this is a kind of contrived example, but it gives you the, it gives you the, so this would not be something you could probably do in practice, but it, but it illustrates the point. If I have a, um, a piece of code, a kernel, which is perfectly legitimate, i equals blot i dx dot x times block dim x plus thread id dot x. If i is even, then do something that if i is, L, is, is odd, then do, do something else. At runtime, within each warp of 32 threads, this is going to run at half the performance because all the even threads will execute first and then all the odd threads will execute next. If it were possible to split it up into, into even and odd blocks of 32, then they would all execute the same thing. This splitting up. So if you want half the threads to do one thing and half the threads to do the other, do get the naive way isn't good, you should split them up into blocks of 32. So the, first thir oh, so the first 32 threads do this if block, the next 32 do this if block, the next 32 do this one. And that means they can all operate at the same time. Again, this is kind of contrived, but the main thing is if you, if, if you have if statements, if you have branches within your GPU code in the kernels, you have to be very, very careful because Blocks of 32 threads can only execute one or the other of the branches. They can't execute the same thing. Because all 32 threads in a block, in a warp, have to be doing the same thing at the same time. And you can mask some of them out, but the ones that are active have to do the same thing at the same time. Um, this is just a bit... There, 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 is a, there are profilers, which I mentioned, which allow you to... Um, to um, um, uh, to, to get basic statistics, which can be useful to guide you as to whether you've written an efficient code or not. So the GPU architecture offers you the two things you want for high-performance computing, high floating point um, um, uh, performance and high memory bandwidth. But the, there, the, the programming model um, can... Um, you have to be careful with the programming model because it actually almost allows you a bit too much flexibility, which can get you poor performance. Mm -hmm. And the things which can get you poor performance are um, having the threads not accessing the memory in the correct order, which means that data accesses aren't coalesced. The, the code will run correctly, but it will run slowly. And similarly, um, you want all the threads in a warp of these blocks of 32 to be doing the same thing at the same time. So to, 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 to access, to, to take advantage of the high memory bandwidth, you need to get this memory coalescing. To take advantage of the high floating point performance, you need to make sure that you don't have too many branches in your code. So you do currently need a good understanding of the application architecture and programming model. So um, programming GPUs is not particularly difficult using CUDA but getting good performance is quite challenging. So, I mean, it's not on the slides, but you might ask, well, if that's all true, you know, why are GPUs so popular? Well, they're popular because often people aren't running their own software. People are using supercomputers to conduct numerical experiments where they're running some package software. So although there might be thousands of users on Archer, hundreds of, the, of them might be writing the same package. The people who write that package, it's worth them spending a lot of time porting this package, this application, to GPUs, because then they know that a huge community benefits from it. So if you only had one particular code you're running for a small amount of time, it may not be worth porting that application to GPU. You may get very good performance, but unless you're going to be running that for a lot of time, um, it may not be worth the effort. The end, you end to end, you know, your, your time up porting the software might outweigh weigh the time you gain for performance enhancements. However, for a large community of users using a single code, it's really worth port the, the developers there porting that code. And that has been done for, for, for a class of applications. And in particular, um, it's something of a lucky coincidence that, that graphics programming requires these two features, high floating point performance and high memory bandwidth that we need in HPC. Um, also, uh, modern sort of um, um, artificial intelligence approaches such as deep learning require, which use neural networks, fundamentally require very, very large matrix-matrix operations. 
and they are very, very quite straightforward to port to GPUs and very, very efficient. And you may not remember, but the um, the uh, the benchmark which is used to, to rank the top 500 computers is actually a very large matrix matrix operation. But matrix dense matrix matrix operations run fantastically fast on GPUs. They are at the core of a lot of these um, deep learning algorithms. And so there are frameworks which, which, that which you can use, and I'm not an expert, but there's one called the NVIDIA the TensorFlow for doing deep learning, where you as a, a user can write quite high level code telling you, know, the, telling you how you want to attack this, this, deep, this, 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 um, this uh, neural network problem. And it will run fantastically fast because the core operations can be offloaded to a GPU server. And the core operations are dense matrix matrix operations, which, are, which are, can run fantastically fast on the GPU. So you can write quite high level code and guarantee that a, a very, very large percentage of it will be offloaded to the GPU and run very quickly. And so, so NVIDIA, oh, sorry, not NVIDIA, but there are people who produce uh, parallel computers which are really there, which are very densely, have a large number of very densely packed GPUs specifically for deep learning. And in fact, um, I think I maybe mentioned right at the start that there's just recently been a new wave of parallel computers installed in the UK called the Tier 2 systems. We have one in Edinburgh uh, at EPCC, which is called Cirrus, which is a several th thousands of cores of fairly standard Intel CPUs. But there is a machine called Jade, which is being run by a collaboration including us in Oxford, but it's actually installed at the Hartree Lab uh, in STFC in Darsbury. And it is a very densely packed uh, box of GPUs, and it's there to support, among other things, um, deep learning applications. So, so it's, it's been built and designed specifically to support these things. And if you were to, to, to use that as a user, you would not have to touch CUDA or anything like that. You would write in a very high level language, things like TensorFlow, which I know very little, but you write very high level language. And because almost all the operations can be done on the GPU, it's offloaded automatically for you. So that's really another happy coincidence where the, the core operations are all kernels which fit very nicely on a GPU. So that was really everything I had to say. Um, I think that's the last slide. So I said there wasn't a lecture I planned to give, but I, as I said, normally, you, you know, the, the way GPUs work have implications on, you know, what order should you do all your loops in, which when you're writing code is quite an important thing to know. If you write all your loops in one order and you have to go and rearrange them all a month later, you're going to be pretty annoyed. So there's a few things you need to know up front. Um, but I think the important thing for spotting them is to run tools. I don't have time to cover that here, but there are tools out there which will give you hints as to whether you've written your program um, correctly or not. So that's all I had to say. Um, I don't have any exercises for the GPU stuff because uh, we'd have to give you access to a GPU machine, which we don't. Well, we, we have access to internal GPU machines at EPCC, but we don't run a service on one. Um, um, but I think that for those in the room. I think the informatics department has quite a large number of GPU servers or is buying them anyway. So if you want to use them, I'm sure there's access locally and nationally. This new tier two service, um, Jade it's called, is there specifically to provide UK wide access to GPUs. So that would be the way you should get access. That is the way you would get access to that. Um, so that's all I had to say. Thanks everyone. I hope you found that useful.